Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Dana Andrews, Ann Baxter, and Cecil Kellaway in The Luck of the Irish. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeling. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we have one of the strangest characters ever to appear in the Lux Radio Theater. It's a leprechaun, one of those famed little men of Ireland who, according to legend, are forever mending shoes and who, if you can catch them, can lead you straight to a pot of gold. Being Irish, they can be depended upon to lend romance a helping hand and see that the right girl gets the right boy. In The Luck of the Irish, adapted from the delightful 20th Century Fox picture, the right boy and girl are played tonight by Dana Andrews and Ann Baxter, and the mysterious leprechaun by Cecil Kellaway. I suppose in other times it could easily be believed that the foamy suds from tiny diamonds of Lux could only be the work of some wondrous creature like a leprechaun. Actually, they're a triumph of the world-famous Lever Laboratories. But however it happens, the leprechauns and Lux Flakes do their jobs the same magic way. Here's the curtain for the Luck of the Irish, starring Dana Andrews as Stephen, Ann Baxter as Nora, and Cecil Kellaway as Horace. <laughs> The Irish countryside, late one summer afternoon. At the edge of a narrow, bumpy road, an automobile's come to an unscheduled stop. That's no use, Bill. I'm afraid we burned a bearing. Oh, fine. First we lose our way. Well, and... anyway, as long as we stick to the seacoast, we're bound to hit Shannon. What if you are a couple of days late getting back to New York, Fitz? For once, the great Mr. Auger can wait. I'm beginning to think you don't like Mr. Auger. I don't like what he does to good newspaper men and go to work for him. <laughs> like me? Yes, like you. Fortunately, I haven't the money to compete with men like Auger. Well, look, Bill, it's getting late. You stay here. I'll scout up the road a bit. It must lead somewhere. Yeah, don't be so sure. Irish paths can be just as whimsical as the Irish... Oh, hey, hey, you. Wait a minute. What are you running away for? Why do you ask? What do you want with me? <laughs> My friend and I are lost. Where's the nearest town? Last, you see. Oh, then you didn't come here looking for me. Looking for you? Well, what would I want with a, <laughs> with a shoemaker? That is what you've been doing, isn't it? Mending shoes? Yes, you are. Mending shoes. In the middle of the woods? Well, all I care about is getting to the nearest village. What might your name be? Now, look. The uh, name? Fitzgerald. Please, I'm in a hurry. Hurry. <laughs> this is a strange word. Hurry. Why would you be in a hurry? Because there's a very important man waiting for me in New York. It's bad to see that you're impatient with me, Fitzgerald. Well, I've enjoyed our conversation. I won't detain you. Thank you very much. Uh, as for the nearest village. Yes, Observe the stream and the waterfall. The water from the mountains comes into my pool with a roar and goes out with a whisper. Down the hill it goes till it quietly reaches the sea near a little village called Ballinabu. You saw me do the same. Well, thank you very much. Good day, sir. Oh, uh, just a minute. Can you tell me if there's a... Hey! Shoemaker, where did you... He's disappeared. What you worried about, Fitz? We found the village, and what's wrong with this inn? I think it's very comfortable. Without a telephone, without a mechanic, how are we going to get out of... Yes? Just me, sir. 
with your luggage from the car. Just set it down anywhere. I never should have listened to that old lunatic at the waterfall. Waterfall, sir? What for? waterfall is that? The one up the stream about a mile or so. I'm begging your pardon, sir. There's no waterfall. But I saw a waterfall. And I suppose I didn't see that old shoemaker either. Old shoemaker? Yes, the, the one with the green coat and the brass buttons. Green coat and brass... Excuse me, gentlemen, I'd better get downstairs. Is everybody balmy in this country? He probably thinks you saw a pixie. I, uh, I brought some towels, sir. Oh, come in. Uh, what time is dinner? An hour or so. If Miss Stove doesn't take it into its head to start an argument. Well, it will if it's like everything else around here. Oh, you mustn't be too hard on us, sir. We're not used to having such grand guests all the way from America. Look, will you tell the old lady I'd like to see her, please? Uh, there's only one old lady here. You're seeing her now. Oh, then uh, tell me, what are the chances of getting transportation to Shannon? If you can wait. But I, I can't wait. Well, you see, the trouble is we're sea-locked. Ocean on both sides of us. Well, it must be boats. Oh, sure. Sean O'Fearn will be glad to take you in his boat when he comes in. Oh, when will that be? He should be back any day now. Any day? But I've... I've... As I said, sir, dinner may be in an hour. <laughs> Well, Teddy, that was a fine meal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I brought you a bottle, gentlemen, lest you feel a chill tonight. Well, sit down. Pour one for yourself. Yeah, but herself wouldn't like it. Me niece, nor. She says a long glass means a short life. You can tell your niece that I once interviewed a man on his 110th birthday. He swore it was the result of drinking a pint of corn liquor every morning before breakfast. Do you tell me that now? <laughs> it's the truth. 110 years. Oh, Tady, uh, how about that waterfall and the old man I spoke to? There's no it... waterfall. And it was no mortal man you had words with. Oh? Who was it then? I mind well who it was. It was him, the leprechaun, and none other. <laughs> leprechaun. Now, see here, Tady. Mr. Fitzgerald, it was a great opportunity you had, and the saints forgive you for not taking advantage. Well, what should I have done? Seize the leprechaun, what else? Make him give you the pot of coal. Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. Well, uh, Phil, I'm going up to bed. A little early for you, isn't it, Fitz? I'll read for a while. I'll see you at breakfast. Katie? Uh, put up your face! Put up your face! Oh, it's you, sir. And what are you doing up there with your head out the window? And what are you doing down there with a bottle of whiskey? Himself has sharp ears. I'm leaving the whiskey on the doorstep for him. Oh, I see. The leprechaun. It is a good thing to leave a bit of something on the doorstep. I thought the, the traditional drink of leprechauns was milk. Milk? Milk, you say? <laughs> if you don't mind the suggestion, sir, get back to your bed and go to sleep. Good night, Mr. Fitzgerald. Good night, Tady. <laughs> Tady's right. I can't sit here at the window all night. If Bill were awake, we could play a game or two. What's that? Someone's coming. Someone's coming down the road. The shoemaker. Well, this time he's not going to get away from it. Let me go. Let me go, you bastard. I brought your bones with favor. Let me go. Oh, no, no, you don't. I'll let you go after you've shown me your pot of gold. And what would a poor, simple old man like me be doing with a pot of gold? None of your lies now. Of course you've got a pot of gold. No right-minded leprechaun would be caught without one. Ah, who's been telling you such stories? Never mind. Now, where is it? Your yeah. gold. Oh, my poor arm. You're twisting it off. Where's the gold? No, no, oh, oh. Under the thorn bush. Not far from your feet, from your, from your ugly face. Oh, the thorn bush, of course. It's always buried under the thorn bush, isn't it? All right, my friend. Start digging. Oh, this is a cruel, wicked thing you're making me do. <laughs> it's your own fault for burying it so deep. <laughs> the it the is, my pot, of course. All right. Lift it out. These, these coins. Well, they're real. 
for the real gold. Now, look, I don't know who you are or what sort of game you're trying to play. Did you steal this money? I never stole anything in my life, except it was rightly mine. Oh. Well, that's one thing we have in common. Here, put it back. You, you, you don't... You asked me to put it back. You don't really think I'd take it, do you? Be, be part of gold. <laughs> you give it back to me. <laughs> oh, I'll never forget you for this, Mr. You are my undying gratitude, son. Here, here, here. Take this little bit for a tip. No, 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 I couldn't. Oh, no. You should just take, take it. I, I want you to take it. Oh, one gold coin. Oh, thank you. No, no, it is I. It is I that am thanking you from the bottom of my heart. Well, all the luck in the world to you. You wish me all the luck in the world? Well, yes, why not? Fitzgerald, you have a way of twisting things in the most perplexing manner. It is I that am saying all the luck in the world to you. Good boy, sir. <laughs> Sir, you're up very early. Oh, good morning, Nora. I, I didn't sleep very well last night. Oh, I hope it wasn't the bed. I kept having dreams. Dreams? Good ones, I hope. Strange ones, anyway. Look, about that waterfall. What waterfall is that? The one by the stream. Mr. Fitzgerald, there is no waterfall on our stream. Now, if you'll sit down, I'll have breakfast. Breakfast the... can wait. Mr. Fitzgerald. We're going to find out once and for all if there is a waterfall up there. But Uncle Tady... Uncle Tady can go and fly a kite. We're taking a walk. Well, Mr. Fitzgerald, shall we turn back now? Are you convinced? But it was right there. I'll swear it was right here. A waterfall. Hey there. Hey. Who are you calling? Well, he's, he's a rather peculiar friend of mine. A, an old man, about, about so tall and very nimble on his feet. Ah, he's, it's, it... it's easy to imagine things here in the woods. Let's cross the meadow, Mr. Fitzgerald. There's a grand view of the sea over there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sure, let's take a look at the ocean. And it's from out there that Sean of Fairness boat will be coming. I wish it were coming now. Is it so very important to you to leave here? What's the chance I've been waiting for? You see, Nora, ever since the war, I've been kicking around Europe, writing for newspapers, magazines. Your friend, Mr. Clark, is he a writer, too? No, no, he's an editor. <laughs> He'd like me to stay with him. But this other offer's just too good to turn down. Well, whatever it is you really want, Mr. Fitzgerald, I think you'll be getting it. Do you, Nora? Nora... You know, if I ever had a daughter, that's what I'd call her. Ah, then you're not married. Oh, but a man should marry, should he not? It's the natural rule and a good thing altogether. <laughs> well, what about you? Doesn't the rule apply to you? Oh, and who would I be marrying here in Ballinaboon? Michael the fishmonger? Or old Farrell who calls himself a farmer? Or... Well? Oh, look, the boat. The one I'm waiting for? Yes. It's the Ariner, Sean's trawler. And your wish has come true. But you look troubled. Nora, this coin, have you ever seen anything like this? Oh, sure. It's an old Spanish doubloon. But how could I have gotten it? Oh, very easily. There have been many of them since the Armada was wrecked here. The farmers plow them up from time to time. I see. <laughs> Nora, you know, it's funny, but now that I know I'll be leaving here, I half want to stay. No. A man like you... You mustn't be looking backwards. No, not ever. But forward to whatever you want from life. <laughs> you shouldn't be so serious, Nora. Not about me. No. No, I shouldn't. Now let's get back to the inn. I know, I guess he's in Shannon, getting on that plane for New York. He's a wonderful man, Mr. Clark. He's a nice fellow, a first-class writer. But he's willing to throw it all away for money. 
working for an egomaniac named D.C. Auger. And you call yourself his friend, saying things like that the minute his back is turned. Oh, I've said the same things to his face, Nora, a dozen times. He knows what's best for himself. <laughs> Don't waste your fine Irish temper, my dear. It isn't worth it. Well, that's the story, Mr. Auger. A fishing trawler to Shannon plane to New York, and here I am. And now suppose you tell me something. After knowing me all these years, why do you suddenly want me to work for you? Well, because I made a big decision, Fitz. I'm tired of just being a publisher. I'm going to run for the Senate. The Senate? Mm-hmm. But where do I come in? Well, you're going to see that I'm elected. Oh, no, I'm no politician. Exactly. Fitz, I've read every article you ever wrote for the American Spectator. Not that I agree with your conclusions, oh no, but you do know people and you understand the issues. Now, you take that piece you wrote about my Paris speech. You called it boneheaded. Dunderheaded, Mr. Ogre. Well, the point is you put your finger right on the weakness of my argument. Well, I could have put my foot on it. Well, that's exactly why I want you on my side. I want you to write my speeches, Fitz. Be my right hand, my brain, my conscience. I see. Cover up your shortcomings by ghostwriting your speeches in the hope that people will be hypnotized into electing you. <laughs> well, yes, but uh, why do you have to insult me? I have to do something for my self-respect in spite of all that money you want to pay me. <laughs> then it's a deal. Okay. Good, good. We'll show them who's a dunderhead. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Incidentally, my daughter wants you to phone her. Oh, is she going to be busy tonight? I wouldn't know. Oh, and uh, here are your keys. Keys. Yeah, I got you an apartment, you ungrateful hack. Here's the address. <laughs> Thanks. And my secretary's getting you a servant. Servant? Mm-hmm. Well, I've never had a servant in my life. Well, we can't have you bothered with trifles, Fitz. Got to keep that brain of yours on ice. We're going to do big things together, my boy. Now, if you want to call Francis, there's the phone. Ah, this is for me, Francis. New York, the best restaurant, and holding hands with a beautiful girl. Fitz, what was their name? Who? Your reason, being two days late? Oh, the Arana. She's a fishing trawler. <laughs> You're cute, aren't you? I mean, that girl at the inn. Her name was Nora. Pretty, I suppose. If you like the Irish. I've missed you, Francis. You don't think I believe that, do you? I'm surprised you call me, Dave. <laughs> well, after all, the boss's daughter, you know. <laughs> oh, look. I'm dead, Francis. I haven't slept for 24 hours. Let's go home. I want you to see that modernistic little nightmare your father rented for me. I spent a whole week fixing that apartment for you. <laughs> You're a busy little thing, aren't you? Interior decorating and convincing Papa that he needed a ghostwriter. Who says I had anything to do with that? Nobody. <laughs> So what are you going to do? Resign? No, but I'd like to know what it's going to cost me. Not a thing, darling. It was sheer altruism. Now finish your coffee and we'll go on home. I, I am tired, Francis, but you can stay long enough for a drink, can't you? But I don't usually drink with people I hate, darling. Now she hates me. Shall I tell you why? Because all the time you were away, you kept coming between me and whatever I was doing. Because I ate, dreamt, slept, and lived you. You and your black magic. I hate your superiority, your black Irish eyes, and your arrogant nose, and if you're not going to kiss me. Oh, what was that? Door buzzer. Excuse me. Who else knows that you live here? Yes? I'm from the Acme Employment Agency, sir. The Acme Employment? Oh, oh, yes. Well, uh, come in. Thank you, sir. The kitchen's in there. If you don't mind waiting a minute or so, I'll let you I heard you last week. This is a fine time of night to be sending people over. Well, did you say you wanted him tonight? I didn't say a word. It was your father's second. Fitz, what is it? What's the matter? That man. Who is he? <laughs> How do I know? Excuse me a second. Uh, are you? Haven't I seen you someplace before? I wouldn't rightly know, sir. Depends on where you've been. Where did you come from? The Acme Employment Agency, sir. I mean, before that. My last place, sir. Where was that? Oh, there were no complaints. No complaints at all at all, sir. 
I take great pride in my work and dry in myself. I'll uh, talk to you later. Yes, Tor. Well? I still have a feeling I've seen him someplace before. Well, how about that drink? Oh, I like the bar, Francis. Was that your idea? So was the scotch. See, your favorite brand. And I haven't even thanked you. No. No, you haven't. Then come here and let me begin. Can I help you, sir? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Yes, you can. Mix us a drink. A drink, sir. Right away, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. But a servant wasn't my idea. Never mind my drink. I'm going. There's too much traffic here. <laughs> it is a little crowded. Shall I see you home? No, don't bother, Fitz. I'll take a cab. Take me to lunch tomorrow. I'll stop by your office. Fine. Good night, baby. You can throw that other drink away. Throw it away, sir. Oh, it's a great pity, sir. One should not waste good food. One should not. All right, all right. Drink it yourself, then. Oh, well, if you insist, sir. I beg your pardon, sir. But there's something wrong. The way uh, you keep looking at me. I, I don't know if anything's wrong or not. Well, you're good health, sir. Ah, and your good luck, sir. Thanks. With you around, I think I may need all I can get. Our stars will return with Act Two of The Luck of the Irish in a moment. New York got a pretty nice Christmas present, didn't it, Libby? Oh, you mean John Garfield and Beatrice Pearson in person. Yes. Yeah. My, I wish I'd been there Christmas Day for the grand opening of their new picture, Force of Evil. As a lawyer involved in the numbers racket, John Garfield is terrific. He certainly is. Enterprise Productions have made an outstanding screenplay of Ira Wolfert's fine novel. The flattering reviews were a very nice Christmas present for Beatrice. Force of Evil is her screen debut, you know. I hear she's going to commute between New York and Hollywood for the next seven years. That's right. Her new contract permits her to spend part of every year on the New York stage. Ah, that'll mean a lot of traveling. Well, fortunately, she learned a lot of shortcuts to easy traveling when she played in stock. Like uh, a box of Lux tucked in her suitcase? That's right. Luxing a pair of nylons en route is just as much a part of her routine as brushing her teeth. Ah, that proves she's a smart girl. Because luxing nylons makes them last much longer. And those new tiny diamonds of Lux get the job done in a jiffy. The new diamonds are so fast, they burst into suds the instant water touches them. And they make richer suds that last and last. They're a real triumph of the Lever Laboratories. Girls like especially the way these new diamonds make stockings last twice as long. Strain tests prove that. Stockings washed with strong soaps got runs much sooner. I'd advise girls who got nylons for Christmas to make New Year's resolutions never to use anything but Lux Flakes for them. Back to our producer, William Keeley. Act two of The Luck of the Irish, starring Dana Andrews as Stephen, Ann Baxter as Nora, and Cecil Kellaway as Horace. It's a moment or two later, and Stephen Fitzgerald stares blankly at his newly acquired manservant, an elderly gentleman bearing a remarkable resemblance to a certain leprechaun from County Clare in Ireland. And you say the Acme Employment Agency sent you here? Yes, sir. What's your name? Well, you, you may call me Horace, sir. I've always had a fancy to be called Horace. Now, uh, what about your salary? Oh, oh, that's all been taken care of, sir. Oh, I see. Mr. Auger's office, huh? Yes, sir. It's incredible. Sir? Oh, nothing. Oh, I'm going to bed. Oh, uh, I'll have breakfast tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Yes, good night here, Mr. Fitzgerald. Sleep well. <laughs> And what can I do for you? I'm from the Acme Employment Agency. You're too late. The position was filled last night. I demand to see the master. And what would you be telling him? That you got the sack from your last place for getting into the port. Not to mention pinching the parlor mate the park was black and blue. Who, who are you? 
How do you know that I... Now, how are we with you before you feel the back of my hand? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Good day, sir. How would I know? How would I know, indeed? <laughs> good morning. Uh, oh, good morning, sir. Who was that at the door? Oh, nobody at all at all, sir. Just make yourself comfortable. I'll have your breakfast ready before you can see Michael McGill. Thank you, Maurice. This is Stephen Fitzgerald. I'd like to inquire about a servant you sent up here. Oh, yes, Mr. Fitzgerald. Well, he came to us very highly recommended. We've had him in several positions. Any complaints about him? Oh, no, sir. Of course, if you'd like references... Oh, no. Never mind. Thank you. Oh, Horace, I want to talk to you. Yes, Mr. Fitzgerald. Come here. Take a look at this coin. Have you ever seen this coin before? No, I, I'm a poor man. Sir. Just answer me, yes or no. I've never seen it before in all my life, sir. You gave me this coin yourself. Me, sir? How could I? Oh, I'm losing my mind. Horace, I'm sorry, but you can't stay here. You'll have to leave. <laughs> leave, sir? Yes, right now. And please stop that crying. <laughs> I'm displeased, dear, and I, <laughs> and I wanted to tell me so. <laughs> well, you don't have to cry about it. The best master I ever had him in my life. <laughs> I've ruined everything. I'm a failure. All right, all right, I take it back. You can stay, <laughs> only stop that bawling. And never mind breakfast, I'll get it downtown. <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald, sir, it's, it's 11 o'clock. You mentioned, you mentioned luncheon or uh, an engagement downtown. Yes, I know. Call downstairs, will you, and tell the garage to have my car ready? Yes, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald, I've been serving you now for two weeks, sir. I hope everything is satisfactory. Yes, everything's fine. I'll tell him I want my car. Yes, sir. You have a busy schedule today, sir. Then what are you waiting for? Just a suggestion, Mr. Fitzgerald. Leave your car at home, sir, and take the subway. But you lose in dignity again at time. Huh? Well, maybe you're right. All right, I'll take the subway. Thank you, sir. Westside Express Subway, Morning Street, Park Place in Brooklyn. Nora! Nora, wait, Nora! Mr. Fitzgerald! Oh, it's, it's you! <laughs> but it's impossible. You in, in New York at a subway station. It's a miracle. Oh, it's it's hardly that. There's a perfectly reasonable explanation for it. It's still a miracle. A succession of miracles. Oh? You see, I didn't take my car today. My man advised me to take the subway. This is the first time I've been in one since I got back to New York. And if I hadn't taken that particular train, I never would have found you. Now, tell me, how long have you been here? Where are you staying? But no, I, I can't answer everything at once. I, I, I've been here five days. And you haven't called me. Oh, but I didn't know where you were. And I'm stopping with Katie's cousin, Mrs. Crimmins, up the street a bit. It's just not true. Oh, but it is. I mean, you're being here. How long are you staying? Oh, it's as long as my visit takes me. You think it was something unnatural that I should be here. It's wonderful, whatever else it is. Oh, wait. The new stand. I promised little Dennis I'd bring him some candy. Yes, lady? This, this candy, how much is it? Uh, please? 50 cents, four bits. Hey, lady, I can't change 20 bucks. Oh, dear. Stephen, would you mind? Oh, I'd be delighted. I... Hey. What's the matter? Well, that's funny. I could have sworn I had... Horace must have let me go out without my wallet. Oh? Either that or, or the subway. Someone may have picked my pocket. Oh, you, uh... You couldn't change a doubloon, could you? A what? Oh, no, not your lucky piece. Come along, Dennis can wait for his candy. I, uh... I, I was just about to have lunch, Stephen. You were? Yes, you know, Mrs. Crimmins' cousin, son-in-law, Cornelius... Has a bit of a bar and grill on the next block. You wouldn't care to join me. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, but except I have a luncheon engagement, and after that, some pretty important meeting. Oh, sure, sure you have. Stephen, you wouldn't refuse me out of pride, would you? Pride? Oh, forgive me, Stephen. Oh, look, I, I, I've changed my mind. I accept your invitation. Now that's best. I never was a man to argue with miracles. Only you'll have to pay the check, I'm afraid. Of course, Stephen. Don't even think about it. The check, Miss Nora. Yes, 
I said, give the check to you. Yes, Connie. The poor boy, he hasn't got a penny. He was going to get a fine job, but I guess it just didn't work out. Would you believe it? He has 50 cents to his name. I'll give him some more stew. A little more stew, sir. Oh, no, please. I, I couldn't. Oh, give him some more, Cornelius. Tis me own wife's ivory stew, sir. And that light, it wouldn't distress a canary. Well, just just a little, then. Oh, Stephen, I, I didn't tell you that Cornelius's daughter's getting married on Friday with a, a big reception right here in the bar and grill. Oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you, sir. If you'd care to attend yourself, sir, I'd be very happy. Eat, Stephen. Finish that stew. Oh, oh, yes, the stew. But you still haven't told me. What are you doing in New York? Oh, it's very simple. Sadie's Uncle Peter died here and asked him a bit of money. Oh, that's that Mr. Crimmins you mentioned? No, no, his Driscoll uncle from Galway. The one that married the youngest Brady girl whose father had the farm next to Sweden. Oh, I see. That one. Yes, you see, Mr. Driscoll had four sisters, and the eldest was married to Seamus Corrigan that had a public house in Limerick that failed for drinking with a customer. So my father took Katie on as a lad to help with the horses, and then he came to America. Corrigan? No, no, Stephen. Uncle Driscoll is on telling you. You see, his favorite sister was Kathleen. That's Katie's mother. He went to sea. He changed his will, leaving everything to Tady. He never cared much for Rory, that little snip of a Ryan girl he married. There was some trouble with the O'Shea's, of course. Oh, yes, of course. They thinking that their mother was entitled to a share, but Martin O'Shea had done well in marriage with the O'Dooleys from Nakashiga. And it's been only a bit of an inheritance, a, a few shillings a month. There was no trouble to persuade him not to make any complications. That must have made everything very simple. Well, it would have been. But for Uncle Driscoll being a bit hazy in his notions and thinking that Tady was a girl. So he left his money to his beloved niece. Can you imagine? I can't understand. What could have confused him? So someone had to come here to straighten things out. And Tady wouldn't budge. He mistrusts the sea and refused flat out to set foot on the Atlantic. So that's why I'm here. Well, I'm, I'm very glad you made it so plain to me. <laughs> and I'm very glad you're here, Nora. I... I never thought I'd see you again, Stephen. When I, when I knew I was coming, I, I wrote to that nice Mr. Clark in London. But he didn't answer. <laughs> That's because he's in Paris. He, he did tell me one thing, though, before he left Ballinaboon. That whatever might happen, he'd be that glad to have you back working for him. Oh? So if, if it's a question of passage money, Stephen, I'm sure he'd advance it. Oh, a bit more than nice. Do. No, no, Nora. No, no, I couldn't. Oh, Stephen, you don't have to pretend with me. I wager you haven't eaten for days. Oh, I'm not that busy, believe me. But I do have to get uptown. Mr. Auger's having a press conference. Well, it's a long walk uptown, Stephen. It'll give you strength. Cornelius, more stew. Oh, no. <laughs> Yes, you've been very cooperative, Mr. Auger. Thanks a lot. Sir. Well, as a newspaper man, I know the problems you reporters have with politicians. Now, if you boys want copies of my speech, why, uh, Fitz will give them to you on your way. Oh, out. oh uh, one more question, Mr. Auger. Yes, I understand certainly. you support the Crawford proposal for Germany. I most certainly do, yes. Then let me read you this clipping. The Crawford proposal is a fraud on the German people, a death sentence for European democracy, and a, depra a betrayal of American ideals. Uh, I never made any such statement. I wasn't quoting you, Mr. Auger. This appeared in the American Spectator two months ago under the byline of Stephen Fitzgerald. Oh. Uh, uh. Well, the answer is very simple, gentlemen. When Fitz wrote that, he was working for somebody else. Now he's working for me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, we uh, all have to make a living, I suppose. <laughs> well, so long, oh, Fitz. Goodbye, boys. Oh. Goodbye. Well... Oh. Was a little too close for comfort. You should have told me about that piece. You read it, didn't you? Well, I didn't remember it was that strong. Fitz, this could be very embarrassing if the opposition wants to make an issue of it. But you knew those were my views when you hired me. Well, for heaven's sake, this is politics, man. What's the matter with you? Now, look, uh, you had better write an article for the New Era magazine. We don't go to press until tomorrow night. Let's see, uh, title it Second Thoughts on the Crawford Proposal. You see what I'm driving at? Yes, I think I do. You know, the other side of the picture, why the proposal in the long run will prove a very sound idea? My agreement with you calls for perjury, but not under my own byline. It will be under your byline, Fitz, and you'll have it on my desk by noon tomorrow. Well? Of course, Mr. Olga. Thoughts on the Crawford proposal by 
Stephen Fitzgerald. Oh, Horace, what are you doing here? I let you go out this morning, sir, without the clean handkerchief. I hope you'll forgive me. Thank you. I said to myself, I said, that's poor Mr. Fitzgerald, writing all those important political speeches and him without a handkerchief to put to his nose. You know, Horace, there is such a thing as taking one's job too seriously. Oh, no, sir. When a man enters the personal services of another man, he surrenders himself to his vocation. Should the master get hurt, the man will cry out. When the master's nose itches, it will be the man who sneezes. He will live for his master, sir, not for himself. But perhaps you find it difficult, sir, because you're the type that wears no man's collar, a proud free man. It is for that reason that I'm proud to be working for you. Will that be all, sir? Yes, Horace, that'll be all. Thank you, sir. Second thoughts, huh? You bet there'll be some second thoughts. coming for dinner? I hadn't planned to, Francis. Look, uh, can I see your father? What's he done now? Been his usual sweet, tactless self again? It doesn't matter, but since you were instrumental in getting me this job, perhaps you should be the first to read my resignation. Oh. I guess I shouldn't tell you this, Fitz, because it's still supposed to be a secret, but if Dad wins this election, he's going to need someone to run the publishing business. Your father should stay away from politics. He has more power right now than a dozen senators. And when he's in Washington, the man who sits in his office will inherit that power. Not if Papa's still running things by remote control. Well, he won't be. I'll see to that. You? How? <laughs> you leave that to me. Father will be completely happy making speeches in the Senate while Stephen Fitzgerald makes history here in New York. It's a very alluring prospect. Only I'm not so sure that's what I want. What I want, Fitz? Do you go with the job? If you want me, I do. You know I do, Francis. And let me have that letter of resignation. I'd, I'd better warn you, honey. I'm saving the carbon copy, just in case. Well, Horace, you needn't have waited up for me. I thought you might require something, sir. Oh, no. Oh, well, Horace, I'm going to be married. Aye, indeed, sir. Would it be the tall lady? Oh? Oh, yes. Miss Miss Auger, yes. Ah, you're a fortunate man, sir. She'll make you a fine wife, sir. It's a very important decision, marriage. Probably the most important decision in a man's life. Oh, indeed it is. May I ask you what prompted you to make it? Well, she's beautiful, for one thing. Oh, she is indeed, that's all. With a man's courage and a man's brain. Yes, sir. And is there anything wrong with a woman's courage and a woman's brains? We won't discuss it any further. No, sir. You have something against Miss Auger, haven't you? Me, sir? No one's forcing you to stay here, you know. No, sir. After the wedding, I'll be looking for another situation. Well, you don't have to make up your mind this minute. Will that be all, Mr. Fitzgerald? Yes, that'll be all. Good night, Horace. Good night to yourself, sir. Oh! Oh, the saints forgive me, sir. I forgot to tell you that I'd waxed the floor. It was very thoughtful of you, Horace. Good night. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of The Luck of the Irish will continue in a moment. Our guest tonight is one of those behind-the-scenes heroines of Hollywood, Margie Corso, head of the wardrobe department at 20th Century Fox. That's quite a responsibility, Miss Corso. It is, Mr. Keeley, 
Especially when we have a picture with as many gorgeous costumes as Jean Tierney wears in that wonderful urge. Old Egg Cassini did a magnificent job of designing those glamorous costumes for his wife. Any girl would envy her. And besides that, she gets her own power in the picture. Who is excellently cast as a dashing reporter who writes scandalous stories about an heiress. This smart comedy with its highly amusing situations is just what the fans ordered for him. When we were fitting Jean's costumes for that wonderful urge, she admitted she adores pretty clothes. The negligees she wears in her dressing room are lovely. You take care of those, too? Oh, yes. And with Lux Flakes, John Kennedy will be glad to know. I use them for all nice washables we have in the wardrobe department. Well, then you know how much faster and richer the new tiny diamonds of Lux are. Mm Mm-hmm. And did you know that these new diamonds of Lux do more for you, too? They remove soil, which other kinds of suds can't. Leave things cleaner and fresher. Well, I know they're wonderful for colors. Nice lingerie doesn't get that washed-out, faded look. You're so right, Miss Corso. Tests prove that wrong washing methods can soon fade colors. But gentle Lux Care keeps lingerie lovely three times as long. So, girls, if you want your pretty new slips and nighties to stay color fresh three times as long... Be sure they get gentle Lux Flakes care. Thank you for coming tonight, Margie Corso. Thank you. Here's our producer, Mr. Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of The Luck of the Irish, starring Dana Andrews as Stephen, Ann Baxter as Nora, and Cecil Kellaway as Horace. With a brilliant future at stake, Stephen Fitzgerald's been working day and night on the election campaign of D.C. Auger. With hardly a thought for Nora, or for the strange little man who calls himself Horace. Now in his apartment, Stephen greets an unexpected visitor, his old friend, Bill Clark. Bill! Bill, how are you? Greetings from Bella Naboon. Hey, aren't you the man who said he'd never come to New York? Well, I'm afraid I had no choice, Fitz. Spectators calling in all his foreign news bureau chiefs. You know, consultation. Oh, boy, am I glad to see you. Look, I don't know how long you'll be in town, but this is where you're staying, understand? Then it is your apartment? Well, sure it is. Well, I'll be giving it up soon, but meanwhile... It's pretty but... expensive, eh? And a servant. Oh, I don't pay for Horace. He's on August payroll, too. Olga, You're still working for Olga? Well, of course. Oh, look, Fitz, you don't have to put on an act for me. What did you do? Told Olga where to get off, huh? Sure. And then he had you blacklisted on all the papers. That's why you can't get a job, huh? Have you been drinking or something? Fitz, you're going back to Europe with me, working for the Spectator again in Italy. Hey, now, wait a minute. You see, Nora's cable arrived just as I was leaving England. Nora's cable? Yeah. Oh, Bill, I'm afraid Nora's made a little mistake. Mistake? (laughs) She must think I'm broke, that I don't have a dime. Bill, I've got that job with Auger. I'm doing fine. I should have known it was too good to be true. Well... Hadn't you better explain things to Nora? Yeah, I guess I'll have to. Why, I, I just haven't had time to look her up. What's the matter with right now? Now? Oh, she'll be at that wedding. Wedding? Yes, at Cornelius' bar and grill. His daughter's getting married. But who's Cornelius? Why, he's Mrs. Crimmins' cousin's son-in-law, of course. Oh. Oh, of course, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll be on my way, Fitz. You... You won't stay here, then? Well, thanks, but all the other boys are at the hotel, and I thought... But I... Well, I'll, I'll see you before you go back to London, won't I? Well, I'll see you tonight, the Journalist Club. I'm going to hear your boss make his big speech. They tell me it's his chance to recapture the sympathies of the working press. I wrote the speech. Don't waste your time, Bill. <laughs> so long, Fitz. Excuse me, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes, Horace? The tall lady, sir. She says she'd expect you to call for her at 7 o'clock. The tall lady, sir. Oh? Oh, oh, yes. Well, call her back. Tell her I'm tied up or something. Are you going out, sir? Yes, to a wedding reception on 6th Avenue. Stephen! Oh, Stephen! Then you came after all. Oh, sit down, sit down. Nora! I just saw Bill Clark. Nora, come along, girl. It's our dad. He offered me a job. Oh, I'm so glad. When you believe it. Nora, the music started. Oh, oh, tell me. Oh, excuse me. 
This is Mrs. Gerald. This is Terence Flaherty of Hook and Ladder Company 38, the pride of the New York Fire Department. Hello, Mr. Flaherty. How do you do? Nora, I... I... smell smoke. Smoke? Why, oh, yes. Can't you smell it? Back room, I think. Back room? It's coming from someplace. I'd have a look if I were you. Clear the way I'm coming through. That takes care of Terence. Now, where were we? Mr. Clark, and, and, and the job he offered me. Just what did you say to him in your cable? Oh, I, I know I had no right to interfere in your affairs, but Stephen, it, it wrung my heart to see you like that. But I have a job, Nora, a very good job. Well, then you lied to me. I didn't lie to you. You did so. Then it was the truth? All that about your automobile and, and a chauffeur and important appointment? No, don't try to wriggle out of it. Just go and try, try and find Terence Flaherty. Nora, now, you're not angry, are you? Well, of course I'm not angry. Oh, poor Terence making a fool out of him in broad daylight. But I tried to tell you, Nora, that it all... It is not. You said... There's no smoke back there. Well, uh, try upstairs, then. Upstairs? Upstairs? Clear the way I'm coming through again. Oh, you're a wicked and deceitful man, Stephen. And me filling you up with Irish... But it was a wonderful stew. It was not. She put too much flour in the gravy. Oh, I, I'm glad you got what you wanted from life, Stephen. When are you going back to Ireland? Oh, my business is finished. I have passage on a steamer tomorrow. But you've only just There's arrived. There's no reason to stay longer. But, Nora, I have so many things I wanted to talk to you about. Now, do you still smell smoke, Mr. Fitzgerald? Why, certainly. Don't you... Hey, hey, wait a minute. What are you trying to do? Terence take your hands off him. But he still smells smoke, Nora. His nose needs adjusting. Hey, 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 do you suppose if I sneaked quietly out the back way... Oh, but you should rest for a while. Uh, but I'm late as it is. Come on. I'm going to see you home. I live here, Stephen. And thank you for your company. <laughs> Apologize to Terrence for me, won't you? Goodbye, Nora. Goodbye. I was hoping you'd see me off on the steamer tomorrow. I'd like to. But, well, you see, I, I'm going to the country for the weekend with my fiancé. Fiancé? I'm being married in a month, Laura. Oh. Oh, I, I see. I wish you happiness, Stephen. Goodbye. Good evening. Good evening, sir. I, I, I didn't... Yes, I, I know, Horace. You didn't expect me home so early. No, sir. No, no, no I, I mean... I mean what I... were you doing just now in the in the kitchen? Oh, nothing, sir. Nothing. I saw you as I came in. You were mending shoes, weren't you? Mr. Fitzgerald, sir. And perhaps you can explain something else. Just a few minutes ago, I happened to put my hand in my pocket. This pocket. Where I keep my gold piece. Only the gold piece was gone. Instead, there was this. Hmm. It is a bit of a pebble, sir. Yes, a little black stone. But half an hour ago, it was a coin. From your pot of gold. Uh, what sort of wild talk is that? I want the truth, Horace. <laughs> sir, let me go. Let me go! I don't know what you're talking about. What about that shoe I saw you hide? And what about the coin? Press, take your hands off me. Take them off. Now, now, I'll, I'll be happy to give you any information you require. You're the leprechaun, aren't you? And I'm crazy. I am. What you see, I am. But as for your mental condition, it is true you're a bit on the weak-minded side. But you're as sane as you'll ever be. 
<laughs> Aren't you a little large for a leprechaun? Well, that's a page of my family history we won't go into, if you don't mind. <laughs> you brought her over here, didn't you? Nora. I didn't bring her over here. You brought her here yourself long ago. In your mind, Fitzgerald, her physical presence alters nothing. What are you trying to do? Ruin my life? I came to you, Fitzgerald, prompted by the noblest motive. Simple gratitude and affection for yourself. For that reason only, I came to dwell in your cold, inhospitable city. And I don't mind telling you, I'm a little bit homesick. My nose itches for the smell of peat. My eyes water for the sight of a black stone in bloom. It is sad indeed that I've been unable to complete my mission, that I must leave you and fail you. I didn't ask you to come in the first place. To be sure you didn't. But you see, I had learned to like you. I offered you gold. It is not my fault that you prefer a black pebble. Oh, Horace. Horace, wait a minute. I... Horace. Horace, I... He's disappeared again. <laughs> Members of the Journalist Club, I hope you won't be too hard on me. Remember, I used to be an honest newspaper man myself. And off the record, I wish I still were. Thank you. Oh, there's just one more thing. If I win this election, I intend to resign from Orbach's publication. As for the man who will take my place, well, you all know him. A first-rate newspaper man and a whale of a good fellow. Steve Fitzgerald. Fitz, I think they'd like to hear from you. Well, go on, Fitz. Say something. I, I'm very grateful to Mr. Auger for his very flattering offer, but I can't accept it. Now, wait a minute, Fitz. In the first place, I'm not the right man for this job. And in the second place, Mr. Auger should have someone in charge of his publications who agrees with him on the issue. Well, is this for the record, Fitz? What are your plans, Fitz? Sure, sure, you can quote me. As for my plans, I really haven't any, except to sit under a waterfall in County Clare in Ireland with an old friend. Oh, come on, Fitz, you're holding out. What about your engagement to his daughter, Fitz? Is that on or off? Miss Auger's right over there. Why don't you ask her? How about that, Miss Auger? You gonna share that waterfall? I don't think I'm invited. But even if I am, as Mr. Fitzgerald would say, I'm afraid I'm not cut out for the job. Well, that's the right. right. Where is he, Teddy? Where's Fitz? Here in the bar room, sir, with a typewriter as usual. A fine place my bar room is turning into. A literary establishment. A bill? Well, did you read the article? How is it? I don't agree with a word of it. Why not? Because anyone who knows anything about conditions in Italy would... Listen, say... I just came back from Italy. You sent me there, remember? Well, I should have gone myself. And if you don't like the article, you can give it back to me. I'll send it to D.C. Auger. Now that he's safely back in the publishing business uh, who again... Who said he'll... I don't like it? I'll run it as a series, Fitz. The usual fee. Now, are you two going to sit here all night arguing? Oh, it's this obstinate husband of yours. No respect for my gray hairs. <laughs> now, don't you listen to him, Nora. He's getting an auger complex. Have a nightcap, Bill? Oh, thanks. I'm going up to bed. I guess we'll go up, too. Oh, uh, good night, Tatey. Good night, Mr. Steary. Oh, Tatey, you can leave that bottle on the table there. I had no intention of touching it. None whatsoever, I assure you. <laughs> if you want anything, Bill, just sing out and thanks. I want a wife like Nora. Sorry, there aren't any more. Ah, I remember that, Bill. If he gets all together, unmanageable. Good night. Fitz? Is that you out there? Quiet. What are you doing with the bottle? It's for an old friend of mine. Just in case he needs something to keep out the cold. Oh. Oh, I see. Well... Good night. Fitz. 
It's Jerry. It's there on the doorstep, Horace. Thank you, Sister Jerry. Thank you. Tis I who say thank you, Horace, from the bottom of my heart. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Say, Libby, mm -hmm. do you want to look into this crystal ball a minute? Mm, what's going on? Well, I see a lady starting to wash her dishes after a big holiday dinner. Mm -hmm. And does your crystal indicate an unhappy ending? Oh, everything's going to turn out very pleasantly. Look, mm -hmm. she's shaking something out of a dark blue box. Oh, it must be a box of Lux Flakes. It is. She's pouring out a stream of tiny sheer diamonds of Lux. Now they've melted away. And instead, she has thick, billowy suds. Say, hey, who's looking at this crystal ball? <laughs> oh, I can see the rest without one. Even with mountains of dishes, those rich suds last and last. Dishes go fast. The lady just rinses them and lets them drain dry. There's no need to wipe the dishes because these new Lux diamonds dissolve so completely, suds rinse away easily. My, that woman looks pleased with herself. She should be. Her job's done in double-quick time, and she's been economical, too. The new tiny diamonds of Lux are thrifty because they go further and do more work. Ounce for ounce, they wash up to twice as many dishes as any of ten leading soaps tested. Why not start the new year right? Try this thrifty Lux way of washing dishes. Get a box of Lux flakes tomorrow. We return you now to William Keeley. Our thanks to Dana Andrews, Dan Baxter, and Cecil Kellaway for an entertaining evening. And here they are. <laughs> Dana has recently returned from England. In fact, he returned on that eventful voyage of the Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> that was really an experience, Bill. There we were at the dock in Southampton, waving goodbye to everybody. Twelve days later, we sailed. Oh, that's a long time to wave goodbye. <laughs> what happened, Dana? You know? Among other things, the worst fog Europe had seen in years appeared without warning. A scientific phenomenon usually caused by cool air moving over a warm body of water. This is in Southampton, just about 200 miles from Ireland. Well, yes. Yes, but it wasn't cool air. Must have been a leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a good time. <laughs> have you picked your play for next Monday, Bill? Yes, Anne. A delightful romantic comedy. It's the Columbia screen success, The Mating of Millie. And we'll have the original stars of the picture, Glenn Ford and Evelyn Keyes. This is one of the most refreshing pictures of the year. And with Glenn Ford and Evelyn Keyes, I know we'll have a hit next Monday night. Hey, Bill. Bill, I think you've got a wonderful idea. There. Jack Benny. <laughs> oh, really? I think... Well, I think, I think, really think that's going, that's going to be a great show. Well, I what are you doing over here in the Lux Radio Theater, Jack? Well, Bill, you know, I'm moving my program to CBS starting next Sunday night. <laughs> on my same time, ahead of, right ahead of Amos and Andy. And now that we're going to be neighbors, I thought I'd drop in. Well, but... that's nice of you, Jack. Why don't you come over and do a show for the Lux Radio Theater? Well, I'd like to, Bill, if I could find the right vehicle. I... I, uh, I understand there's a picture coming out called Portrait of Benny. <laughs> that, uh, that sounds like it might be good for me. Huh? No, no, Jack. That's Portrait of, uh, Jenny. Oh, oh. You see, uh, Joe Cotton plays the lead, and, uh, you know, well, you're not quite the cotton type. Well, I'm not exactly burlap, either, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'll try and think of something for Lux, and then I'll be back. So long, Bill. Good luck, Jack, on CBS Sunday night. <laughs> Good night, Jack. Good night. New Year's Day has always been a time for us to take inventory of our lives. Perhaps this year we may ask the question... Are there in America racial and religious prejudices 
that threaten our unity as a people. And having asked that question, we may then resolve that whatever blessings of health, happiness, and prosperity 1949 may bring should not be only for a few, but for all Americans. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in wishing you a most happy new year. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Glenn Ford and Evelyn Keyes in the mating of Millie. This is William Keeley saying good night and happy new year. And Baxter appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and will soon be seen in Yellow Sky. Dana Andrews appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn, producer of Enchantment. The Luck of the Irish was based on the novel There Was a Little Man by Guy and Constance Jones. Join us next Monday night to hear Glenn Ford and Evelyn Keyes in The Mating of Millie. Finer, richer tasting cake, Spry tops any other type shortening. Spry's amazing cake improver takes guesswork and hard work out of cake making. Try Spry's one bowl method for glorious cakes. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry. S P R Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Mating of Millie, starring Glenn Ford and Evelyn Key. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>